welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. This is a great turnout. Wow. I guess all the snowbirds haven't flown away yet, huh? But the birds are moving north to Alaska right now, as the people will be quite soon, as it gets warmer. Anyway, I'm Kurt Leuschner. I'm introducing myself today, and uh, I teach over at College of the Desert for 22 years now. And um, um, today I'm going to be talking about the Salton Sea and the birds down there and the situation down there, and also about a big lake that preceded the Salton Sea called Ancient Lake Kawea. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end, and then when we're done, you can come up and ask me even more questions. So all your questions will be answered by the time you leave the room. Uh, there's a little handout back there that some of you may have grabbed or, uh, that has my contact information on it. So if you um, want to bug me later and email me uh, further questions or send me photos of birds or whatnot, that's great too. Um, so I teach classes over at College of the Desert on conservation and native plants and birds and entomology, insects, so all that kind of stuff. We do a lot of outdoor uh, field work with our students, taking them outside and into the field. Um, and then I give lectures sometimes like this and uh, teach a lot of classes on the side for the, on the weekends at places like Anza Borrego and Joshua Tree, for example. So anyway, welcome, and uh, let's proceed with the program. So um, you can see the Salton Sea in there, which is a pretty big body of water if you've been down there, but uh, look at that body of water around it there, this ancient Lake Kauai and how large that was. It was six times bigger than the current Salton Sea. So that's a large body of water. We're going to be talking about that. Now, don't confuse ancient Lake Kauai, which was the name of this big body of water, with the current Lake Kauai. Lake Kauai County Park, some of you have been to, is over behind La Quinta. And that is a small reservoir. It's the terminus of the Coachella Canal. The Coachella Canal brings Colorado River water from uh, Yuma, Arizona area to the Coachella Valley, and they store it temporarily in Lake Kauai. And then when the farmers need it, uh, they can ship that water to them fairly quickly from Lake Kauai instead of shipping it all the way from Yuma, Arizona every time. And meanwhile, people can go there and recreate a little bit and enjoy the weekend. Uh, but that's Lake Kauai. Um, we're talking about, again, a much bigger lake, six times bigger than the current Salton Sea, and it's called Ancient Lake Kauai. Here's that canal I was just mentioning, the Coachella Canal, bringing water from um, Arizona and the Colorado River to our area. So here's Ancient Lake Kauai, and as you can see, it was much larger than the Salton Sea, six times bigger overall. It was uh, 300 feet deep. Current Salton Sea is about 20 to 25 feet deep. So 300 feet deep. Uh, it was as wide as the current Salton Sea is long. So it was 35 miles wide. It went from one side of the valley to the other and over 100 miles long. And its last occurrence was less than 500 years ago. So we're not talking about thousands of years ago or tens of thousands of years or millions of years. We're talking about 500 years ago. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but most of our valley was underwater then, all the way up to about the Indian Wells Tennis Garden would have been the north shore of this giant lake. And this was a freshwater lake, not salt water. Now, if you go back millions of years, we have a history of uh, connections with the Gulf of California and the ocean, and there was salt water in this area, which deposited a lot of the salts that make our soil so salty today. But this uh, was a more recent um, lake, and it was freshwaters formed by the Colorado River. So again, if you go back in time, you can see that there's been many incursions or, or additions of this ancient Lake Kauai. It comes and it goes. But for the most part, it's there. So our, our valley, this area we call the Salton Sink, which is below sea level, has a long history of having water in it. In fact, it usually has water in it. So to not have water in it is, also, is kind of the exception to the rule. So when people say, for example, that the salt and sea is accidental and it's a mistake and we should just let it dry up, 
because it shouldn't be there anyway. That's not really looking at the big picture. They need to look at this slide and see that, yes, it is natural for us to have water in the Salton Sink. And if we hadn't have tamed the Colorado River and dammed it up and diverted the water, um, we would be having ancient Lake Cahuillas occurring on a regular basis here in the Salton Sink in our area. That's not going to happen, I don't think, while we're in charge, but one day it will probably return again. And it's very much a part of the natural cycle here. So um, today's Salton Sea. The current uh, Salton Sea that you probably know is, uh, was formed a little over 100 years ago, around 1905, 1906. There was uh, what probably was an El Nino type year, and the Colorado River uh, flooded a little more than normal, and it quickly overran the irrigation scheme that they had constructed down in the Imperial Valley along the border of Mexico. Couldn't handle all the flow, and before you knew it, the whole entire Colorado River had changed its course and started heading for the lowest point in the area, which is the Salton Sink, which is over 200 feet below sea level. And it took them almost two years, uh, a good 18 months, to stop this flow and get it back on course. But meanwhile, the current Salton Sea had been formed. Here they are trying to stop the flow, and it took them a while back then to do that. So we were left with this body of water we now call the Salton Sea. And because the soils are so naturally salty, there's a lot of salt in the Salton Sea, so it's not fresh water. And because the water that flows into the Salton Sea since 1906 is somewhat salty, because it's bringing in salts from the surrounding land, it's making the Salton Sea more and more salty every day since 1906. It has no outlet, and as the fresh water evaporates, the salts are left behind. So they just continue to accumulate. It's one of the problems that the Salton Sea is facing today, too much salt. Um, as you can see, it's about 35 miles long and 15 miles wide at the widest point. It's much saltier than the ocean, and this number continues to rise. 40% uh, or maybe 50% saltier than the ocean now. It's um, at least 232 feet below sea level, and that number is also changing almost on a monthly basis. Um, and up until a couple years ago, there were estimated to be almost 400 million tilapia still in the Salton Sea. Tilapia are freshwater fish from Africa. I'll show you those in a minute. Um, it loses about six feet a year to evaporation. So if it's only 20 to 25 feet deep on average, you can see that it could dry up very quickly if not for those agricultural inflows that kind of keep it um, relatively balanced all these years. So I take a lot of people down to the Salton Sea. I was down there three, four times in the last two weeks with various groups of folks. And if you haven't been down there yet or haven't been down there with me, um, I hope uh, we can arrange that. Um, usually those tours happen in January and February. So if, if any of you um, want information about that, just make sure you're on our Desert Cities Bird Club email list. And if you're not on it, um, you can leave your name and your email address with me today, and I'll be happy to add you to that. And then you'll hear about all these opportunities to go down there. But usually on a typical day, we'll circle the sea. We'll travel around it in a clockwise fashion and, and hit all the different hot spots around the sea. Now here are the, the fish that were in the Salton Sea up until recently. In the last decade, three of these four species have died out. Uh, so if you're looking uh, at the upper left, that's the tilapia. That's the one fish that's still hanging on, still in the sea, but their days are numbered. Uh, the one in the upper right is the Gulf croaker. It's gone, lower left. I mean, the lower right would be the orange mouth corvina, and lower left would be the sargo. So these other three that are gone are sport fish that were introduced around the 1950s. Uh, they're saltwater species. But as the salt levels rose in the Salton Sea, it got too salty for these saltwater fish. That tells you how salty it is. Ironically and, and surprisingly, the only fish left in the sea is a freshwater species from Africa, the tilapia. 
So they prefer fresh water in Africa, but apparently they have a high tolerance for salt as well. Because again, they're still hanging on, although barely. Uh, the heyday of the salt and sea was probably in the 1950s and 60s. Maybe some of you were lucky enough to go down there during that time. It was a very, very busy place with a lot of people back then, getting more visitors at the state park alone than Yosemite National Park every year. Uh, very crowded, very busy place. If you go down there today, it's not quite the same. Um, which is a shame, really, because it's a beautiful and wonderful place, even today, and I go down there all the time, and, and most of the time it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. It doesn't smell or any of those things that you might think are happening. They aren't. Um, so more people really should go down to the Salton Sea, but the problem is it's got s such a negative press over the years that people just seem to want to stay away from it and believe all those myths and rumors. The uh, North Shore Yacht Club in the lower left has recently been restored, and so you can go down and appreciate that building. It's now a community center for the small town of North Shore. But that was designed by uh, local architect Albert Frey. And so these are just some scenes from, uh, you know, late 50s, early 60s. The Yacht Club opened in 1958. So it's still there. <clears throat> but you won't see all the boats like you see here now. In fact, there are currently no boat ramps in operation at the Salton Sea. So there's absolutely nowhere to put your boat in because it's already starting to recede uh, so that the boat ramps aren't functioning. You've heard about uh, many of the plans to save the Salton Sea over the years. So in 2003, there was a, an agreement reached called the QSA, if you want to look it up, QSA. It's called the Quantification Settlement Agreement, 2003. And that agreement um, reallocated the Colorado River and redistributed the water in it. And so um, places like San Diego, for example, got a bigger chunk of that water because they desperately needed it. Uh, and farming got less of that water. So in, a, in an essence, you're sacrificing some farmland for the benefit of cities like San Diego so they can get more domestic water from the Colorado River. So you, you're taking some farm out of operation, you're taking the water that would have been used for farming, and you're gonna transfer that water then to somewhere else. And uh, so it won't be used for farming now, and, and then it won't flow into the Salton Sea either. That's where the Salton Sea comes into play. It's not gonna receive as much water as it was um, prior to 2018. Now when this agreement was reached in 2003, that was 15 years ago, 2018 seemed like a long way off. Like, oh yeah, well we'll figure something out by then, right? Well, here we are, I'm checking my watch, it's 2018, and I'm still standing here and we still haven't really done anything with the Salton Sea, and meanwhile the water transfers are beginning. They, they started in January of this year. And so uh, the Salton Sea has already been receding a little bit in the last few years, and now that recession is going to continue um, even more so. And at its peak, and it's hard to say exactly when it's going to peak. It might take a few years or so for the, for the peak to happen, but it's going to receive 40% less water than it currently had been the past you know, few decades. So with 40% less water flowing in because it's being now diverted to other places, um, you can expect the sea to shrink significantly, as much as 40%. And if the sea shrinks, of course, the salt levels, which are already sky high, are going to just really skyrocket through the roof, and that'll be the end of the tilapia. So the next couple of years, uh, we could see the end of those tilapia, for sure. We'll see um, the sea shrink. Don't know how fast, but it, it could be a lot faster than we're used to, and uh, we might see more exposed playa then which could create some dust problems. It's another issue that we have to, to address and think about. So this is a big year to be talking about the Salton Sea, and we've, we've known this year was coming for a long time, and here it is, 2018. So we're all kind of bracing ourselves to see what the next few years, the next five, ten years are going to be like, because things are going to start changing down there, maybe quite a bit, and we're all going to have to get used to the new uh, version of the Salton Sea. So anyway, there had been plans they were talking about the last 15 years, like this one, where they were going to cut the sea in half, build a big dike across the middle, um, create a 
fairly fresh water lake in the north that could support a fishery while sacrificing the southern half of the sea and letting it dry up and become super salty. Um, but that never happened. Uh, the costs, of course, were in the billions, and that kind of money just isn't available, and it hasn't been found. And so these ideas are still out there, but uh, they're not really going anywhere, mostly due to the high cost. Other ideas have been building canals to either the Gulf of California down in Mexico, which is less than 100 miles away. Maybe you could build a canal uh, to exchange water between those two areas or even one to the ocean. But again, we're talking billions of dollars for either of those ideas, and they just haven't really taken off or gone anywhere. So we're kind of stuck with um, what they're calling the 10-year plan. So if you want to look up like the current situation of the Salton Sea and what what the current plan is, it's called the 10-year plan. It starts this year, and um, you can get more of the details of that plan, but essentially what it's going to do is going to take whatever money they have, which might be about $300 million if everybody votes the right way in the fall, so make sure you get out there and vote because there's going to be a bond measure on there that's going to release some of this money to the Salton Sea. But assuming that money gets released, they might have three to four hundred million dollars to work with, which sounds like a lot. But in the grand scheme of things, it, it, you can't do all that much with three to four hundred million. But they're going to do whatever they can with it um, to the best of their ability. And so the plan is to use that money and use the limited amount of water that's still going to flow into the sea. It's not going to dry up completely. Um, but to direct that water to the areas that need it the most. And most of those areas we're talking about are at the southern end where there's wetland habitat. So they want to be able to maintain those good wetland habitats at the southern end near the Sunny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge. And they want to add some additional wetlands at the southern end with this money and with the water that they have. So they want to enhance the ones they have, add some additional ones, um, stock some fish into some of these wetland areas so at least there'll be some fish in the area for the fish eating birds. They're going to do a little bit of enhancing at the northern end. There's a few good wetlands around the Whitewater River Delta. They want to maintain those, too, and enhance those a little bit. And then they're going to use the rest of the money they have left over for dust control and dust mitigation. So we don't have a giant health hazard on our hands with dust clouds. So that's the current plan in a nutshell um, with the money and the water that they have to work with. Um, Ten-year plan, it's called. So again, uh, you know, people have talked about building canals. It's actually less than 131 miles, depending on how you look at it. But it's doable. It's just really a matter of money, and and it, it is a little more complicated than it seems because to make this work effectively, you probably have to build two canals: one to bring in water from the Gulf of California downhill into the sea, and you're going to need something to pump water out of the sea. Otherwise, the Salton Sea is going to continue to be super, super salty. It's never going to be able to equalize unless you have two canals. And now you're doubling the cost. Now you're talking about pumping water uphill back to Mexico. And this all assumes that Mexico is on board with this too. You know, maybe they don't want our Salton Sea leftover water coming into the Gulf of California. They've got ecological issues of their own they're trying to sort out down there. And Pumping it full of uh, super salty salt and seawater probably isn't going to help that issue either. So it's doable, you know, and maybe this will uh, come up again, but it's, it's not really feasible at the moment, and there's no money for it either. Now we're kind of uh, getting into ancient Lake Kauia now and talking about um, the bird. I'm going to get into the birds that would have occurred there and occur at the Salton Sea today. And there's uh, various tribes. Um, the Kauia Indians uh, have numerous tribes, and some of these are, were local and lived near the Salton Sea. And um, on the shores of the Salton Sea are these fish traps. I'm going to show you a picture one in a moment. And so the Kauia would come down from the mountains in the winter time to fish when the weather was good and set up camp near the shores of ancient Lake Kauia and then maybe in the summer when it got hot they would head up into the hills places like Idlewild and change their diet. So if you come with me to the Salton Sea sometime well and you've probably seen this yourself just behind La Quinta and, and those areas you might see this water line on the mountain. This is the shoreline of ancient Lake Kauia which is about 60 feet above sea level and uh, you can see that 
what looks like a bathtub ring there that shows you where the height of the water was for ancient Lake Kauia, this giant freshwater lake. And at the base of this, or right at the edge of this water line, if you know where to go, are these fish traps. There's a whole bunch of them. And they're still visible after all these years, after hundreds of years, and in some cases over a thousand years. There's various rows of fish traps here. And these were constructed by the Kauia on the shores of ancient Lake Kauia. And the fish that lived in the sea at the time uh, in ancient Lake Kauia, I think I have a picture of them coming up. Yeah, here they are. Razorback sucker and bony tailed chub were two of the fish that they were catching in this freshwater giant lake. And so these fish would swim into the um, circular area, which was right on the shore or edge of the ancient Lake Kauia, because fish naturally are seeking shade and little nooks and crannies to hide in, so they would swim in there to find refuge. And then since there was only one exit and one entry point, it was real easy to cover that up and then just go into the middle of the fish trap and just scoop the fish up into a basket. They're trapped, fish traps. And so they really worked, and there's just hundreds and hundreds of these fish traps still visible today. So it must have been a very busy uh, scene back in the day. Fish of ancient Lake Kauia. Well, uh, now we're going to get on to the birds, which is more my specialty. And um, there were California condors in the area back then. And the good news is that we may have California condors coming back to our area soon. Uh, there's over 400 of them, closer to 500 now, after a historic low of only 22 birds back in 1982. They've built the population back up due to the help of the Endangered Species Act to almost 500 birds. About half of those are in the wild and, and maybe half in captivity. And they've now released the birds in four different areas. Uh, the, the historic area is just north of LA in what's called the Sespe Wilderness. So that's still the core population. They've got another population up north near Big Sur. So if you drive Highway 1 along the coast, uh, when you get near the Big Sur State Park, Pfeiffer Burn State Park turnoff, start looking in the sky for condors because they're very frequently seen there right along the highway. And then if you go to the Grand Canyon now at the South Rim, you'll often see California condors sitting right on the edge of the walkway by the El Tovar Hotel. So uh, that's probably the easiest place to see condors in the wild now. They've got a population in Arizona. And the fourth population is to the south of us now in Mexico. They've established them in the uh, mountain range south of the border. And uh, for, so for the first time in hundreds of years, at least, uh, condors are flying free in Mexico. And at least one of those birds uh, flew up across the border um, over San Diego and then went back into Mexico. And San Diego's not too far from here, so I could easily see one of those birds in the Mexican population flying over here uh, to our area one of these days. Or we may get one from the LA group coming uh, east to our area. Um, they did have one get as far east as Big Bear, and Big Bear's not too far from here. So the condors are on the way, and, and soon they'll be uh, returning, we hope, to our valley as well. They're members of the vulture family. Meanwhile, we'll have to uh, settle for turkey vultures. There's plenty of those around. We've been seeing a lot of them at Sunnylands lately. And um, I will be leading a bird walk there this Friday at 8.45. Um, this Friday and next Friday, and this is a free bird walk. If you all come, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, but I hope to see some of you there. It's 8.45 to 9.45, and it's free, and we'll walk around the gardens. And, and with any luck, we'll see some turkey vultures because they've been roosting there on their way to uh, Hinkley, Ohio, for the Vulture Festival. <laughs> well, that's where they're headed. Uh, but it is, they are migrating through the area, and they are one of the earliest migrants, so we always start seeing them in January and February, and there's plenty of them around right now. And certainly they were along the shores of ancient Lake Kauia, too, eating dead fish and other things back in the day. Um, golden eagles are residents of the area, and they certainly would have been around ancient Lake Kauia as they are today. And bald eagles are fish-eating specialists, so they would have been around ancient Lake Kauia as well. We occasionally see a bald eagle in the Coachella Valley or at the Salton Sea. The nearest nesting ones, however, are up in Lake Hemet. They've got a nesting pair up there, and there's a bunch more nesting up in Big Bear. 
So we do have bald eagles in the area and golden eagles, even today. Our most common hawk back then and today would have been the red-tailed hawk. And the most common owl um, back then and also today is still remains to be the great horned owl. Roadrunner is another bird that um, we see a lot of, and uh, it's one of our special birds of the desert. They don't migrate, so they, they're a resident of the area, member of the cuckoo family. Now, the two most common hummingbirds of this region are the costas and the anise hummingbird. Costas is the one on the left with the purple gorget or throat, and the anise on the right it has more of a reddish throat compared to the costas. The females... Um, are, are quite plain. That's a female costas in the upper right photo there. Now, um, we actually have three kinds of quail in the area, and the Cahuilla Indians living along the shores of ancient Lake Cahuilla would have been living amongst all three, because when they were down on the shores of the lake, they would have been seeing and maybe even hunting the gambles quail, which is our desert quail down here. And if you go up in the mid-elevations, when you start to get to the scrub oaks and the pinyon pines, you start to see the California quail. They're kind of a mid-elevation bird, but sometimes they'll come down to the desert floor too, like they do at Palm Springs. So in the Indian canyons, you can actually see both gambles and California quail. They mix there right at the desert floor. The California quail, which is the one in the middle, happens to be our state bird, by the way. And then if you go up further yet up to, you know, Lake Hemet and Idlewild area, now you're in the realm of the mountain quail, where the Cahuilla would have spent their summers. So three quails, all within a few miles of each other. And right around the area of, um, right in those mid-elevations, there are some places where you can actually see all three species in one place. They all come together, right around Pinion, for example. Now the osprey is a fish specialist, like the bald eagle. And they certainly would have been on ancient Lake Cahuilla, and they're at the Salton Sea today. They winter at the Salton Sea. They don't nest here. They fly up north to Wyoming and places like that for nesting, but they come down here in pretty good numbers in the winter. Now, if the Salton Sea loses its fishery, if those tilapia disappear, um, these fish-eating birds are really going to be out of luck. I mean, they can't switch their diets. Um, so one has to wonder, you know, where are the ospreys going to go? Where are the white pelicans going to go? Where are the eared grebes going to go? And the list goes on and on. There's a lot of birds that use the salt and sea that are exclusively fish eaters. So that's one of my main concerns is, you know, where are they going to go? And somebody might say to that, well, they'll go to wherever they went to before the salt and sea was there. Okay. Do so you want to play that game? Um, Okay, so let's go back in time 100 plus years when, when the Salton Sea wasn't there. Birds were going to wetlands along the coast. Birds were going to the Colorado River. Birds were going to a huge, vast delta uh, wetland area south of the border in Mexico between here and the Gulf of California. All those areas are degraded or don't even exist anymore. We've lost 90 to 95% of our coastal wetlands in the meantime, gone. The Colorado River is just a small trickle compared to what it used to be. It no longer hardly even makes it into Mexico, and what little water does make it into Mexico is quickly used up, so that vast delta that used to exist is dried up. Um, so we've proceeded to take away every other option that birds used to have 100 years ago, and meanwhile, all we've left them is the Salton Sea. So they become dependent on the Salton Sea, and it's our fault. That's the way I look at it, and so that's why I think it's our obligation to try to keep it going for them. And the osprey is one of those birds that really needs those fish. Here's some more fish eating birds that really are counting on us to do something about maintaining the fish. And the belted kingfisher in the upper left, black skimmer, upper right, western grebes, lower right, common loon, lower left, and double crested cormorant in the middle. All of these are fish eating birds. One thing uh, we may see more of uh, is some or many of these birds visiting our local lakes here in the Coachella Valley. So if you live on a golf course or a country club or a place that has lakes, you know, encourage whoever is in charge to stock them with fish. 
uh, because it could be an alternative for some of these birds. We might get a lot more visitation from these fish-eating birds to our local lakes. They could become more important. Here's some more of those fish-eating birds that are counting on us. The pied-billed grebe, there's one with a tilapia in its mouth at the Salton Sea. Uh, snowy egret in the middle, ring-billed gull in the upper right, great egret in the right, lower right, and great blue heron in the lower left. Now some of these birds can eat frogs and other things besides fish, but fish still remains their preferred food. Now the Salton Sea and, and ancient Lake Kilwea were full of shorebirds because, uh, we, you know, we live right along this Pacific Flyway. It's a big freeway of birds that go from Alaska to South America and back every year. And so some of these birds are just pit stopping here along the way, fueling up and then continuing their journey in both directions, depending on the time of the year. And other birds, just like the people, are spending the entire winter here in our region or at the Salton Sea. So they're really counting on the Salton Sea to give them what they need for the whole winter for many, many months. And these are some of the birds that live on the edge of the Salton Sea. Now these particular species won't be as affected by a shrinking Salton Sea as some of those other ones because they don't eat fish. And there's still going to be plenty of shoreline, probably more shoreline now, for them to perhaps enjoy and find food. So these shorebirds may be okay um, in the new changing Salton Sea. We've got long-billed curlew on the upper left, marbled godwit upper right, mountain plover lower right, and black-bellied plover lower left. Well, none of these are endangered, but the mountain plover in the lower right and the long-billed curlew are, are declining. And um, they may become endangered if, if that doesn't change, but they're not there yet. So the waterfowl, it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of um, the effects of a changing salt and sea on them. Many waterfowl species are vegetarians. And so they're not going to be as affected, again, by the loss of the fishery. But those that eat fish, like the hooded merganser in the lower left, yeah, they're going to have to make some uh, changes in where they winter. Um, so we have hooded merganser, lower left, wood duck in the lower right, gadwall, upper right, and American widgeon in the upper left. All the species of ducks occur at the Salton Sea. It's one of the neat things about going down to the Salton Sea in the winter is you, you can see all the ducks in one day if you're lucky. Here's some more of those waterfowl you might see. Um, redhead, upper left, northern shoveler, upper right, snow goose, and Canada goose. All of these are vegetarians. They're not fish eaters. So they should continue to, to do quite well, even in a smaller Salton Sea, we hope. And another neat thing about ancient Lake Kauia and the Salton Sea is um, you can actually see four falcon species in one day, if you're lucky. You need a little bit of luck. But there aren't many places you can go and do that, but the Salton Sea is one of them. That's the American kestrel on the upper left, very common. Never missed that one. The merlin in the middle, that's one of the less common falcons, but we do see them at the Salton Sea. I saw a couple of them last week. Peregrine falcon in the upper right, with, which used to be endangered, and now it's not. It's made a nice comeback after DDT was banned in 1972. And we see more and more of those at the Salton Sea all the time. So that's a really good sign. And a prairie falcon, which has always been a resident of the area. One of the real highlights of going down to the Salton Sea in the winter is to see the huge flocks of geese. Uh, snow geese and Ross's geese, these white geese with black wingtips. Sometimes you'll have thousands and thousands of them flying overhead. And so they spend the entire winter down there. Now, they're not fish eaters, so they too won't be as affected by the changes in the Salton Sea. So we'll continue to be able to enjoy those huge flocks for many years to come. Um, they're, they're starting to head north already. Uh, many of them have already left as of a couple weeks ago. Um, and with the climate changing and getting warmer, you know, birds are migrating earlier and earlier, it seems, every year. That's not necessarily a good thing, but they're just, you know, doing what they're programmed to do. Um, the other bird that's a real highlight in the winter at the Salton Sea are the sandhill cranes. 
And down at the very southern tip of the Salton Sea, there's a flock of about 300 that we're able to enjoy and watch all winter long. Now, they too have already um, left. There might be a few of them still hanging on, but um, it looks like uh, most of them have already departed and headed north to Canada or Alaska for, for breeding. This is a, a, an interesting bird that lives on the shores of ancient Lake Kauai in the Salton Sea. It's called the loggerhead shrike or the butcher bird. And it actually impales its prey on a thorn like it did with this rufous hummingbird here. <coughs> That's why it's called the butcher bird, right? It likes to hang its victims. So if you see a skewered lizard or big grasshopper or small bird, you know, stuck to some thorn in your yard, this is what happened. The butcher bird came by. Now, he'll come back later to eat it, so just leave it there. Um, and take a nice photo of it, too. <laughs> Send it to me. I'm collecting photos of Shrike victims <laughs> for a, a coffee table book. <laughs> so... You, you, you think I'm kidding. You're laughing. <laughs> I've got a good little collection, but I need more. I do need more. So um, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but there's a couple birds in particular that are really dependent on the salt and sea and have become more dependent in the last hundred years for the reasons I already mentioned. And one of those birds is the eared grebe. I mean, a huge percentage of their population winters at the salt and sea or used to winter there. The last two winters, we've seen hardly any. For the, like the first time I can ever remember, um, I, I led a trip down there a couple weeks ago, and we didn't see a single eared grebe. I couldn't find one. We, we, and I've never had that situation. And so the question is, where do they go? And I don't have the answer. I don't know. I hope they've found somewhere else to their liking. But the last two winters, we're already seeing uh, precipitous drops in numbers of eared grebes and white pelicans as well. Now, if you go to ebird.org, which is a place you can report all of your bird sightings or look at what other people have seen, that's a great place to get the most up-to-date information on how birds are doing out there. And so you could look up eared grebes and look up white pelicans and even compare them year to year or month to month and see what those trends are. So that data is still coming in, but we're already noticing, like I said, the last two winters, uh, the birds seem to already know that something's up and things are changing down there. And so some of these birds are switching course, we hope, because um, there's really only two alternatives. If they're not finding the food they're gonna, they need, they're either going to die or they're going to have to go somewhere else. So we just hope they're going somewhere else. We just don't know where that somewhere else is. Ruddy ducks are also um, really fond of the areas uh, around and in the Salton Sea. Lots of ruddy ducks uh, from North America winter at the Salton Sea. The good news for this bird is, again, it's a vegetarian. So it's not going to be as affected by the fishery loss. So hopefully it'll still continue to come down here in big numbers and thrive. The white pelican, though, again, is a fish eater. So it's not so lucky. And their numbers seem to be dropping already, even though the water transfers have just begun. People have been reporting a lot of white pelican sightings around the Coachella Valley this winter. And um, again, one idea is that maybe they're desperate. Maybe they're not finding the fish that they were at the Salton Sea. And so they're searching some of these ponds around here and maybe stopping by at your country clubs a little more often, hoping to find those fish. So if you see a flock of uh, large white birds with black wingtips soaring in the sky, because I get, I get this question all the time, you know, what are those birds? Those are the pelicans, American white pelicans. Snow geese, which is the other large white bird with black wing tips. First of all, you're hardly ever going to notice snow geese migrating. They seem to sneak through when we're not looking. And they fly in a V, typically, like a traditional goose flock would, like a V. And they have what's called a powered flight. So they're going to be constantly flapping and moving forward. They're not going to sit there and soar around. So if you see the birds soaring uh, with their wings just wide open, not flapping at all, 100%, those are going to be American white pelicans. So it's a very common sight here in the desert and in the Coachella Valley. 
So now you don't have to phone me up every time you see that and ask me. But you still can. It's okay. Um, brown pelicans, another fish-eating bird, um, do occur at the Salton Sea and may have occurred in ancient Lake Kauia. But they really are more of a coastal bird. So they've always been more common on the coast and then they occasionally wander inland. Although the last decade we've been seeing more brown pelicans at the Salton Sea for some reason. That's probably going to change, though, as the fishery disappears. There'll be no reason for them to venture inland and show up here. They should just stick to the coast. But the way that the brown pelicans feed, you know, they dive on their food. Maybe you've seen this at the beach in La Jolla or somewhere. You can see the pelicans diving into the waves. Um, that's how they catch their fish, and that's more amenable to living on the coast and fishing out on the coast. The white pelicans feed from the surface of the water. So they'll float on the surface, they'll form a circle of pelicans, and they'll all plunge their beaks into the middle of the circle simultaneously and drive the fish to the center, and then they scoop them all up like a water ballet. So it's very synchronous. So they feed in a totally different way than the, than the brown pelicans do. And that's why the white pelicans like to be on freshwater lakes, they like to be inland. The brown pelicans prefer to be on the coast, out in the waves, and uh, in the salt water. The Salton Sea is a weird place, though, because it's, it's inland, which is more to the liking of the white pelican, but it's salty. And so I think these pelicans are confused, both of them. You know, the white pelicans like it because it's an inland body of water and it has fish, so I guess they don't mind that it's salty. Um, but the brown pelicans probably uh, wonder, you know, why this inland body of water is salty. Um, but their fishing techniques still are better on the coast. This is another bird, by the way, that was endangered. This was the first bird to go on the endangered species list and, and the first bird to also be removed from the endangered species list. So they've had a good comeback, too, since DDT was banned. Now, the Salton Sea, and I'm sure ancient Lake Kauia, too, has hosted some very rare birds over the years. This is one of the rarest of the rare. This was a bean goose. I don't know if you got to see this one, but it showed up about six or seven years ago at Unit 1 at the south end. This is a Siberian goose. Flew all the way here from Siberia. Wasn't that nice of him? So if you can imagine this bird summering up in Siberia, probably a young bird. It's usually the young birds that make these mistakes. Um, and instead of flying south towards Africa, which it should have done over Europe and Asia, um, it took a slightly wrong turn over the Bering Strait and then came down the Pacific coast and ended up at the Salton Sea, which is about the right distance for going down to Africa or somewhere. And this happens from time to time with these Siberian birds. They take one little slight wrong turn up there and it turns into a whole different wintering ground down here. Sometimes they'll make the same mistake year after year. So you'll see the same strange bird show up in the same wintering ground each year. But they're not going to find any mates or any friends uh, when they do this. So ancient Lake Kauia and the Salton Sea um, have always been like the only place in the United States where you can have a chance of seeing a blue-footed booby. So it's really a specialty bird of the area. These birds come up from Mexico, and they're usually young birds without the blue feet. Um, and they, they do what's called post-breeding wandering. So after these young birds are born, they tend to wander a bit. And sometimes they wander the exact wrong direction. So they start flying north instead of flying south. And suddenly they find themselves over the desert, lost. And they see that Salton Sea, or they saw that ancient Lake Kauia shimmering in the distance, and they head to it. And that's how they end up at the Salton Sea. Because again, it's not that far from the Gulf of California where these birds breed. Not that far as a bird flies, or the booby flies. So this is a blue-footed booby. And I saw my first one down at the Salton Sea in 1996. Um, and it was uh, quite a moment. And when I was growing up, I used to have that field guide right there. And so it was always a dream of mine to see a blue-footed booby at the Salton Sea. Because that's what it says in the field guide. It says, only occurs at the Salton Sea. <clears throat> so I, I remember thinking to myself back in like the fifth grade or something like, wow, you know, maybe someday <clears throat> I'll be able to go to the Salton Sea and see a blue-footed booby. So the dream has been realized, and that's why I moved here to Palm Desert. 
Um, this is another crazy Siberian bird that took a wrong turn over the Bering Strait, and it's called a ruff. So it nests up in the Siberian tundra and normally winters in Africa. But again, one wrong turn means it winters at the Salton Sea. So we get one or two of these uh, showing up every winter at the Salton Sea, a ruff. And the Salton Sea is also one of only two places, the other being uh, Texas, where you have a chance to see all four longspur species in one field. So you got the chestnut collar, the Macowns, the Lapland, and the, what am I, the Smith's longspur here. Um, so that doesn't happen too many places. And these longspurs like to hang out right outside the Calpatria State Prison at the south end of the sea. So you just go down 111 and take a left on Sinclair Road, and in four miles you'll come to the prison. Park your car right there and look in the field. That's how you do it. You all know Highway 111, right? Just get on it and head south. It's that easy. Turn left on Sinclair. Um, this is another um, more unusual bird that shows up at the Salton Sea from time to time. I saw my first one there in 1980, and this is the reddish egret, a bird you normally see in Texas or Florida, but it also occurs sporadically here at the Salton Sea coming up from Mexico. It's more of a tropical bird. And they feed in an unusual way. They'll, they'll hold their wings out, like you see the one on the left, and they'll cast a shadow on the water. And fish normally swim into shadows. They're always seeking shade, right? And so they're very patient. They'll hold their wings like this, cast a shadow, and as soon as the fish swim into their shadow, lunch. So they're very patient, but it works. It's fun to watch them doing this. This was taken at the Salton Sea. So, you know, no fish in the Salton Sea means no more reddish egrets doing their thing. It's kind of sad. The Salton Sea and ancient Lake Kauai have always also been the only place in the United States to see the yellow-footed gull, another one of these tropical species that just barely ranges up into California and the U.S. right at the Salton Sea. That's as far north as it ever goes. Yellow-footed gull. The best place to see them is a place called Obsidian Butte at the south end. And um, a couple years ago, um, Chet McGaw found this real rarity, a great black back gull, the very first record ever in California at the Salton Sea. Salton Sea is the place for bird watching. Um, this is a bird that normally occurs off the coast of Maine, okay, New England. So how in the world did a gull from Maine get to the Salton Sea? A lot of wrong turns. Do you think it you think it flew across the country 3,000 miles over deserts and mountains and all? No, I think not. Do you think it went down through the Panama Canal and came up? I don't think so either. <laughs> so here's the other theory, and this one actually makes sense. It came across the top and went down. You know, there used to be ice up here. It's gone. In the summertime, it's melted. It's not there anymore. There are actually waterways now. You can get all the way across. And birds are figuring this out. And they're following those waterways. They're going west. And then they drop down, and they're showing up on the Pacific coast. So this one came across the top, dropped down, and ended up at the Salton Sea. How about that? It's the only way possible, really. The Salton Sea has always been an important stopover point for this rare bird, the red knot. It's not on the endangered list yet, probably should be but it's another one of those birds that's severely declining and being watched very carefully. Um, and again, luckily they're not fish eaters, so they'll be able to continue to enjoy the shoreline of the Salton Sea, we hope. And the snowy plover is a federally threatened species, so this one is on the endangered species list on the right, and they do nest sporadically along the edges of the Salton Sea, so we hope that that will continue as well. The um, piping plover on the left is a rarity from the East Coast that's occurred a couple times at the Salton Sea. And this is the mountain plover. I showed you this one earlier, but this one is declining and being watched, and it, it likes freshly burned fields. So um, when the farmers burn their fields and leave behind a black charred field, that's when you'll find these flocks of mountain plovers. There's a... Um, a species of rail, a subspecies that is, that is endangered, that lives permanently at the Salton Sea in ancient Lake Kauai. 
And it was up until recently called Clapper Rail. So if you didn't get the memo, they've changed the name. It's now called Ridgeways Rail. So uh, this subspecies is the Yuma subspecies, Yumaensis. So it's Yuma Ridgeways Rail. And they occur both at Dos Palmas Preserve at the north end of the sea, where we've also been leading some bird walks lately, and also at the, the marshes of the Salton Sea. And you more frequently hear them rather than see them. They sound like somebody kind of clapping. That's why they're called a clapper rail. They used to be. The clapper rail now is back east, so there still is a clapper rail. They split them. This is a bird, another fish-eating specialist that's become much more common at the Salton Sea in the last 10 or 20 years called the Neotropic Cormorant. So it seems to be expanding its range northward, um, and now we've seen them both at the southern and now the northern end of the Salton Sea. So now the double-crested cormorant is not the only cormorant in town. And one of these days we'll have one of these showing up at one of our local ponds here in the Coachella Valley, so watch for it. <coughs> it's smaller than the uh, double-crested cormorant and has kind of a little white line around the edge of its um, guler pouch there. This is another rarity that occurs at the southern end of the Salton Sea and also in the Coachella Valley sometimes called the ruddy ground dove. Really pretty bird from Mexico. And uh, this is an irregular bird that winters at the Salton Sea in ancient Lake Cahuilla, but this year we've actually been seeing them right at the prison so again, 111, take a left on Sinclair, go down three miles and park, and while you're scanning the fields looking for mountain plovers and long spurs, look up on the wires and the mountain bluebirds will be putting a show above your head. They don't do this every year, but this year they are there. It's guaranteed if you hurry. One week you've got. I'll give you one week, guarantee. And then the guarantee's off. But this is a bird that's not well named because um, there's another bluebird you probably know called the western bluebird, right? And the western bluebird is more of a royal blue. This one is a, kind of a sky blue. This one happens to be the state bird of Montana, which makes sense, you know, big sky country. Um, but it's called the mountain bluebird. The, the western bluebird is the one that nests in the mountains proper. So if you go up, say, to the top of the tram or go to the Sierras or go to the Rocky Mountains, and you're up in the forest there in the high mountains and you see a bluebird, it's gonna be a western bluebird. But it's so tempting to wanna to call it a mountain bluebird, right? Because you're in the mountains and you got a bluebird in front of you. And so of course it has to be a mountain bluebird. But mountain bluebirds actually breed on high plains. Okay, they don't like the mountains proper. They're, they like the high elevations, true, but the high plains, Colorado and Wyoming, places like that. And they winter in the Salton Sea and in the deserts which really has nothing to do with any mountains, right? So I think they got it wrong. They should have named the other bluebird mountain bluebird, and maybe this should have been the western bluebird. But they do winter at the Salton Sea, uh, and they're always fun to see. <clears throat> and vermilion flycatchers also winter at the Salton Sea. They're starting to at least attempt, we think, to breed here in the Coachella Valley from time to time, although we haven't confirmed it yet. We hope they're breeding at Sunny Lands, but we're not quite sure yet, but um, they do breed nearby at Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. And they winter here for sure. So yeah, every golf course has got probably one or two pairs of these things wintering somewhere on your course. So check it out. Vermilion flycatcher. Yeah, it's one of the most beautiful birds uh, we have here in the desert. Uh, Crystal Thrasher is another bird that occurs around the shores of ancient Lake Cahuilla and the Salton Sea in the scrub. And this is another um, bird that comes up from Mexico from time to time called a wood ibis or a wood stork. They used to be more common at the Salton Sea. Now we haven't noticed them in many years. Another bird that used to be more common at the Salton Sea coming up from Mexico is the fulvous whistling duck or tree duck. This duck breaks all the rules. It doesn't quack, it whistles. So it's called a whistling duck. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't sit on the ground and waddle around, it sits in the tops of trees. And it's a very upright duck, as you can see. So it doesn't even sit right for a duck. So it's an upright duck that sits in the tops of trees and whistles. <laughs> Fulvous whistling or tree duck, how about that? I wish they'd come back. They used to be a regular thing every summer at the Salton Sea. And um, every now and then we have a, a rare West Coast hurricane 
that comes up to Mexico and maybe into Baja and the Gulf of California. And when, when that happens, the bird watchers go crazy because they know all kinds of rare birds are going to get blown out here into the desert and to the Salton Sea, like the magnificent fricket bird. So there was one of these at the Salton Sea um, a couple seasons ago after one of these hurricanes. So you never know what might get blown up into the Salton Sea, especially after a hurricane. Here's a couple of super rarities that have occurred at the Salton Sea. The roseate spoonbill on the left and the Ross's gull, by far in a way the rarest bird that's ever occurred at the Salton Sea. This was in November of 2011. I think it was November 6th, um, Friday night. <laughs> So it arrived on Friday night, at least that's when it was first detected by Guy McCaskey. It went on the bird hotline that night. I picked it up just in time, canceled all my plans, went down there the next morning. I left at 4 a.m. so I'd be down at the Red Hill Marina, you know, right at first light. And by the time I got down there, there were already 100 birders down there <laughs> with their spotting scopes and cameras trained on this poor little bird in the lagoon. It was like the paparazzi, you know at the Academy Awards or something. So these, these birders had traveled all night from LA and San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara and San Francisco. They were just coming in droves. That's how rare this bird was. At 10 a.m., it got up and flew to the east and was never seen again, so. <laughs> that's what we call a one-day wonder, you know? And, and that's why I live where I do, because I'm always, you know, within a day's drive, you know, a day uh, of the Salton Sea. I mean, I'm within an hour of the Salton Sea. But so when, when the next rare bird shows up, you know, we can be there very quickly. So get on that bird hotline. But that, anyway, the Ross's gull is so rare. It normally occurs in the Arctic Ocean. So that's how far off course it was. North of Alaska. What's it, what was it doing down here? We don't know. And, of course, burrowing owls are always fun to see at the Salton Sea. And they're always there year-round. We've got a year-round flock of burrowing owls that lives down there permanently. And then they're joined by their Canadian and northern U.S. cousins throughout the winter who come spend the winter with them. And then the, the migratory ones fly back north and the resident ones stay behind. Kind of sounds like the people. So, um, again, I'll take any questions you have and you can contact me anytime.